testing. We want to, first of all, acknowledge our Samantu, our Creator, our Creator God, for uh, bringing us together today. Acknowledge our Kateak that are here. Acknowledge our Kateak, uh, both our, our Mushums and our Kukums, the ones that lifted our Raspagans this morning for us on behalf of what we're going to do today. And I thank them very much, a very heartfelt, very emotional pipe ceremony that we had this morning. Uh, we were given good direction, good thought, and uh, so I acknowledge that in a good way, and we prayed the way we prayed. Acknowledge our, our head table here that are seated with us. Of course, Chief of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, Chief Bobby Cameron, our Tribal Chief, FHQ, Five Hills Capel Tribal Council, Chief, uh, Tribal Chief Jeremy Fourhorns, our team. And of course, sitting next to me is, I call her my auntie, I call her my sister. One of our Kateak, one of our knowledge keepers, and the keeper of our language. Sharon Stronger, and so I welcome her too, and she'll bring her remarks in a little while here. I acknowledge our team that are sitting here, our council, our team members, and some of our team that are on the side as well. Thank Cherish for, for organizing us, organizing this day, and of course our team, providing you this comfort, providing you this space, to come and sit with us. We acknowledge you that way in a good way. Of course, my brothers, my colleagues, my sister colleagues, the Ogimaos of our nations, I'm very honored that you come and you sit with us and you bring your, your prayers, your guidance as well, and your support for what we're going to announce. Acknowledge our, our membership, our citizenship. We acknowledge that way from our members that, are, that live in, in the urban settings, in our rural areas of our towns and villages. So I acknowledge all of you that way. Acknowledge the ones that are here and the ones that are online. Our new way of business these days, online. Acknowledge the ones that are sitting here. The ones that are, are part of this process. Indigenous Service Canada, Health Canada, our MLAs that are here, the ministers that are here that could be here. So we acknowledge you for, for taking that time to be here. Our hearts are heavy today. This has been a very emotional journey for all of us on the team, our community. We acknowledge that this is not our fault, what we're doing here. We acknowledge that. We're just doing the necessary work, what was brought here and what was given to us in terms of the land where you are. We call it, and we named it after our first and our member, 
original chief of Wapi Mustasis, white buffalo calf. So that's the lands you're sitting on. And as we know, this was the last residential school, this site, this very gymnasium that you're in. It housed the students, the young people that went here up until 1998. Prior to 1973, as we understand it and we come to know, and you all know in your minds and your hearts, who ran these institutions. Whether you call them oblates, whether you call them Roman Catholics, whether you call them priests, whether you call them nuns, those are the individuals that intended to give us good, edu good education. But as we understand it, that was not it. That was not the way. Up until 1973, when some of our local First Nations took over this institution and did their best to give appropriate education, better education, if you will. So we acknowledge that work for a period of 10 years until 1983, when our nation of Star Blanket took over this base, this land base, and the school, the institution that was here. And in our minds, in our hearts, the leadership at that time, at that time. We did our best as well because we were aware of the things that were happening in the past. We didn't know exactly what was happening, but we knew something happened. So they managed it the best they can. They brought in our ancestral way. They brought in our languages. They brought in programming. Well, thank you. It's one of the school systems. Eh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All of a sudden. <laughs> no, they were shut off a long time ago, so I don't know what that was. But in 1983, that's when we assumed the responsibility of this land, the responsibility of the institution that was here. And the sign behind me, the Coppell Indian Residential School. And there was a number of names that included the Labret Indian Residential School. A number of names. And, and to our knowledge and to our understanding, there was, it was the third school. There was two other schools prior to that. Way back in time, way back when it started, when they started this process. So we are understanding that there was three, there was two schools that burnt down. And you probably are aware, some of you, in what you have read, what you have learned, in preparing yourselves. So very briefly, before I send it back to Sheldon, that was our history. And we did our best, we managed our best, and we did our best to move the young people that were here out into the communities, out back into their nations. And some of them are here. Some of them are leadership. Some of them are here. So we take a little bit of comfort in that by knowing that we did a little bit good work. That's not me. <laughs> But I wanted to acknowledge that. I'll say some more statements once Sheldon has give you a true briefing, or not a true briefing, a briefing of what is about to be announced. I'll leave it at that for this moment in time. 
but just to end by saying in this in my portion of, of introducing this that it was unthinkable it was profound it was sad it was hurtful and it made us very angry what had happened to our young people here prior to 1973 and maybe it worked itself into the later years, but we did our best to make sure that those kind of things didn't happen here. So I'll say that much for now. I'll do some more statements in a little while. I'll pass it to Sheldon, who has a, a deadly mic than me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, hi. A Britney Spears <laughs> mic, they're telling me. Yeah. I wanted the deadliest mic, okay? so, <laughs> I was kind of half joking, half not joking when I said I wanted a mic like Britney Spears. I was kind of joking, but kind of not really. I wanted, really wanted one and they got me one, so I have to use it now. So I'm sorry if my mic is more deadly than all the other mics here. But I want to acknowledge uh, everybody here. Um, we all have an attachment to this site. Some of us are former students. Some of us have family members that went here, friends, relatives. I want to acknowledge everyone because we're, we're in this together. This site housed a lot of survivors throughout the years. Lots of students from all over the country and even some states folks come up and, and attended school here. So this information is going to hit home. I'm not going to, not going to lie. Uh, I'm going to start with my report. I just want to acknowledge everyone. Uh, we did introduce the mental health and wellness team. Uh, maybe, maybe give one more wave. They're all in the back there. If at some point in time you feel, oh, and over on the side over this way too, if you feel compelled to approach them and, and you need that support immediately, by all means, go and use them. We have designated areas uh, that you can, you can sit down with them uh, if what you hear today uh, affects you. Um, they're, they're, they're here. They're here all day uh, for, for our support. So I'd like to thank our mental health and wellness team too for being available uh, to us. Uh, during this time. So I want to do a brief history uh, right now of, of the school. Uh, the very first school that was on this site uh, was the Coppell Indian or was the uh, industrial school, Coppell Industrial School. And uh, there it is. It's the only school out of the three because there was three that were built on this site. The only school to face south, to face the, the water uh, to the south. After that, subsequent schools that were built, the, the entrances faced west, faced towards Fort Capel uh, that way. But this site, the original site, uh, faced south towards, towards the lake. Uh, that's going to be significant uh, in, in, in a little bit here through, through my presentation. But that was the first school. Uh, this is the school that Father Huguenart was principal of from uh, 1884. Uh, until his passing in 1917. Uh, during that time, uh, we do have a special relationship with, uh, with the Cross Lake uh, IRS project there, uh, Sadney Robinson and his crew, because Huguenot uh, spent some time over there, from here. Uh, they were having uh, a little difficulty getting their school up and running up there in Cross Lake, so uh, Huguenot went over there to kind of uh, get the administration on the road and everything like that. So we, we have a close connection with the, with the Cross Lake folks uh, because of that connection through Father, Father Huguenard. So a little bit of a, a side note there. Um, the, the original school burnt down in 1903, 1904. Uh, it burnt to the ground, so they built a second school uh, in 1904. Um, and then, then again, uh, that one burnt down in 1932, uh, the second school. 
and then subsequently in 1935, the third school. Uh, this is where the majority of us here uh, still have ties to, to, to that third school. I was, a, I was a student, former student here at the third school. Uh, so was my mom, my dad, a lot of my aunties and uncles, you know, they, they all have that, that attachment to that third school. So that was built um, in, in 1935 and was, uh, there was some additions to it uh, as, as that school matured. And then, like Chief had mentioned, uh, uh, once it closed, uh, it was it was torn torn down, um, based on you know feelings of the of the site and what had happened here. Uh, a lot of the input uh, around that was was to tear the school down. So, so the Star Blanket uh, leadership of the day uh, honored that request and and, and tore the school down. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce a little bit of the of the project team. Uh, oh, there's some of the, the school, the third school there. So uh, these are the folks that are currently on the project team. Obviously, Chief Mike Starr, Councillor Edgar Starr, uh, Councillor Catherine Stonechild, Councillor Joanne Starr, Councillor Matthew Nuxius, uh Sonia Starr, she's our Director of Finance, uh, myself uh, as Director of Operations, Marcel Starr. He's one of our cultural advisors, but he's also the Director of Education. Uh, Victor Starr, he's the other culture advisor, but he's also the community research coordinator uh, for Star Blanket and for specifically our health center. Uh, Ariane Star Blanket, who's our community navigator. Uh, Gerard Wolf, uh, he's the project manager, but today he's our sound man uh, over there. And Sherry Belgard, uh, my better half, uh, is the other project coordinator. So that's the main. Oh, and Cheris Francis, uh, media relations, uh, she, she just come on to to arrange the day today. A lot of planning and all that uh, went, in, went to that and we thank uh, Cheris for, for putting that together. And our newest addition, Kaylee Starblanket. She's our executive assistant. Uh, she's the newest member of the project team. So uh, all the project team here. So uh, project team, wave, wave to, to the people. You know, there's the project team folks. Uh, they're the ones that uh, uh, have guided and taken uh, uh, direction from the community and, and have uh, steered the project uh, to, to present day. Uh, so this is a picture of the Axiom. I believe his, that hit, that's Taylor. Uh, this was in the early stages of the GPR uh, search and scanning. Uh, I took this picture myself. I thought it, you know, uh, a picture speaks a thousand words and I felt that maybe that was a that was a good picture to take while while we're searching the grounds, you know, in in the shadow of uh, of uh, the the uh, Sacred Heart uh, Church. There, I thought that was a, a significant uh, picture to take to, to uh, take. Um, in the early stages of the project team, uh, we got invited over to Kauzis's uh, IRS location. They they openly invited us. They wanted to share, you know, the trials and tribulations uh, of their project. Uh, and their ground search, and they and they shared a lot with us as far as knowledge on technology, as far as the do's and don'ts. Um, their their team was very very helpful and kind of put us on that path. Uh, the mistakes that they learned, uh, they they helped us to avoid uh, when 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 we started to mature as as a project team. So a special thank you to. Houses First Nation and their IRS team for, for putting us on, on the path and making sure that uh, we had all the information necessary uh, for our team to, to be successful. Um, once we visited that site, uh, we needed to pick a group that were subject matter experts in ground penetrating radar. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, interviews, a lot of different companies uh, came and visited with the project team, with Chief and Council and uh, we eventually picked the group called Axiom. Uh, Axiom, they, they, they're, they're an astounding group. They have uh, access to a lot of uh, expertise, a lot of uh, subject matter experts, and uh, I believe uh, as IRS groups uh, uh, begin their journey on their projects, uh, they're, they're taking a look at, at Axiom. Uh, we, we want to give a plug to, to Axiom, you know, they're very good, good to work with, they, they, they know their stuff 
and they're very timely with their reports uh, to us on things such as scanning data and, and things like that. So thumbs up to, to Axiom, uh, Taylor, and, uh, and Tanya, and, and, and the crew up there at, at, at Axiom. So what they were able to teach us, what Kauzis kind of taught us, and what Axiom continued to teach us was the GPR technology, ground penetrating radar. What that means, what it does, and specifically what the limitations were. Uh, we thought, you know, oh, we're gonna have this radar run around, run around the ground, and that that technology is just gonna instantly tell us what's what's under the ground. Well, that wasn't really the case. Uh, for those of us who are familiar with the technology, the best that that technology can do is tell us, okay, well, there might be something there. You know, it scans uh, ground disturbances and it it looks for these different anomalies uh, in the ground. And then there's different challenges. Uh, this area is one of the hardest areas to scan as far as GPR, uh, just because of, you know, a uh, long time ago, uh, a glacier. conditions for uh, a GPR to, to, uh, to scan. So we had to get very creative. We had to teach uh, the technology what to look for in this type of, of uh, soil, in this type of, of ground. So it was a lot of work and I'm glad Axiom was very, very patient with us as we learned about the technology and as we worked together to kind of uh, isolate what it is we were we were trying to look for. Once we got all that uh, out of the way, um, uh, areas of interest uh, started to be identified. There's different uh, phases of, of scanning that we're wanting to do and we've completed phase one. That's basically all the flat land around uh, what used to be the school area. So, the land closest to the church over there, the track area, whoever's familiar with, with, with the grounds, the track area, all the way south, uh, the ball diamond area, all the way this way towards the, the old bridge, the old concrete bridge, all the way back up to the hockey rink, uh, and then on the parking lot here. So all that has been, has completed as far as phase one. We do plan to go off site. Uh, we do have, 50% uh, commitment from some of the landowners uh, in the seminary areas. We have uh, listening to the stories, uh, listening to, to the guidance of former residential school survivors. You know, uh, I heard a story about here, you should check here. I, I've, I've heard uh, this area is, is an area of interest. There's stories about that area. So we took a lot of that, a lot of the information and, and we, 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 we sent Axiom to, to those specific areas. So we, we want to scan the seminary area. There's a place called Ghost Town, whoever's familiar with, with the area here, Ghost Town, that there's a lot of stories uh, associated with that. There's a lot of stories associated with across the tracks in the residential area there. There's stories uh, behind the little church up on the flat part on, on the pasture land uh, up there. These, these, a lot of areas off site that we have to work with the landowners moving forward in the different phases off the reserve now to, to do scanning. So that's, that's what we have to do now. Next, moving forward, we have to meet with these individuals, gain their permission, scan the area and, and see what, uh, see what we can find. There's, there's two very, uh, extremes of, uh, of, I guess, willingness. You have some that want to do what they can to, to help uh, the project, the volunteer time, yeah, whatever we need, all we have to do is ask and, and they'll help us out. And then you have the ones that are a little bit more, you know, reserved, a little bit more skittish, they, they kind of don't want to get involved, you know, and, but, but both these extremes have land that we're, we're interested in, uh, in, in scanning. So, 
uh, it's going to take some tact and some diplomacy to kind of get everyone on the same page in, in the coming days. Um, so now that we understood what GPR can actually do, uh, we're able to understand the data. When Axiom scans, they go, they crunch the numbers, they come back, they report to the project team, they explain, okay, this is an area of interest, that's an area of interest and, and whatnot. And then we're able to better understand that as a, as a project team and understand what they're, what they're talking about. Uh, in the early days, we did a lot of grid work. Um, we had this whole, this whole gymnasium, uh, with with grid we, we we had like colored twine and everything you know pieces of wood and 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 whatnot to to make those grids because we needed to lay grids out for the for the gpr to follow uh because they needed a very a very uh specific track in in order for for the data to be to be collected uh accurately uh, so there was a lot of work putting those grids together. There was a lot of volunteerism. Uh, we relied a lot heavily on volunteers to help us out. Uh, once the grids were made, then it took teams of volunteers to move those grids in, in big sections. So they would scan this entire grid area, and then our team would have to roll up all that grid, go over to the next and unravel it, and then they would scan again, and we have to pick it up and roll it up again, go to the next one. So that was during the warm months. Uh, during the winter months, it actually got really, really easy because the GPR signal likes to travel through frozen ground better than warm, moist, moist ground. So... Uh, a lot of the area they were able to cover during the winter months and really didn't need too much uh, too much help from from the volunteers because they just followed their own their own tracks with that with that uh, that that uh, GPR machine. So I was glad I wasn't looking uh, forward to spending hours every day standing outside trying to move grids around in the snow. So I was I was happy when they said, "Oh yeah, no, we can we can make our own." Our own tracks and and continue on with that work so that was that was very very good um we had a lot of we made a lot of partnerships along the way uh a shout out to fsin who who uh, initially funded uh the project work uh while we were getting our application in place um and getting our, our proposal in place and putting our work plan together and our budget plan and everything like that we wanted to get going as a project team we didn't have the dollars yet and then uh, Marmy, Marmy uh, Poitras uh, was someone that we reached out to on on the FSIN side, and they said, "Hey, we we have uh, we have budget. We we apply to the same to the same fund. Uh, we have budget. We can kickstart your 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 project uh, while you wait for for your proposal to to go through." So we we approached FSIN, and we. We did what we had to do to, uh, to 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 work along that, and we were able to get uh, startup dollars through through the FSIN. So thank you FSIN for uh, for bankrolling the the initial uh, days of, of of the project. Um, there were other uh, support groups that wanted to come and and help out. Uh, the Archdiocese of Regina, uh, that Sacred Heart Church is is uh, a part of. Uh, they've been more supportive uh, over over this past year and a half, year and a half, you know, whatever we needed, uh, as far as volunteerism, you know, food, supplies, whatever we needed to to make the project go, uh, they were more than willing willing to to help out. So, uh, a shout out to the Archdiocese of uh, of Regina, and also, and then of course, you know, uh, Minister Miller here, who's who's watching us uh, over Zoom. You know, he oversees the uh, residential schools uh, missing children community support fund. Uh, that's basically the proposal that we wrote to. Uh, there was a lot of discussion between the project team and the minister's team. You know, Jolie, Sarah Ferguson, all all those folks uh, having those meetings, going over the work plan, coming up with a with a I guess a uh, an agreed upon kind of. Uh, um, plan moving forward so uh the understanding was is uh for the time being you know they would they would fund us up to the point of discovery and then if a discovery was made then we would take a look at other supports beyond that so they were 
they were very helpful in that regard. We, we, we were uh, successful in, in our proposal and we were able to fund uh, the project from, from then on. So uh, a shout out to uh, Minister Miller and, and his team uh, for, for approving our, our project and, and helping us uh, uh, fund what we needed to do to, to uh, get the work done here. Uh, so I'm just gonna go into the GPR data now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the Zoom folks can see that, right? Okay, so basically what we have here, so like I said before, uh, we've scanned all the areas around where the school used to be. So this is kind of a, a shadow of the, of the third school. So whoever's familiar with the third school, you know, there's the classroom building behind there, the gym, the boiler area, the laundry room area, the dining rooms, and then the and in the, the the classroom and in the the uh, dormitories there in the, in that one structure, so we've all those little dots. If you can see those little dots, those are areas of of interest. Now the color coordination of the dots could means different things. Uh, a color might mean when the scan took place because we we scanned in segments uh, throughout the past year. So. I won't go into too much detail about that, but a color code could mean when the area was scanned. It, it, it also means at the depth uh, that, that the area was scanned. Uh, it can be anywhere from one meter to, to I mean, one foot to, to eight feet uh, deep, uh, depending in, on uh, how much uh, areas of interest were and how more of an in-depth scan needed to happen there. So all those colors and those different things mean something. Uh, so after everything is said and done in just phase one, which is just the open area around, uh, around the, the site itself, uh, we acquired uh, over 2,000 confirmed uh, hits uh, for, for, the, uh, for, for the scanning. So does that mean there's 2,000 unmarked graves? Uh, we, we, we don't think so because there's, there's anomalies, right? GPR can't definitively say that's something. Uh, it could be a, a stone under the ground. It could be a clump of, of gravel. It could be a piece of wood, or it could actually be something. We, we don't know yet. All we know is that there's over 2,000 of, of them, uh, and, and that's documented with, with uh, Axiom. So, the plan moving forward with that is now we have to come up with a strategy on how we're going to determine what's a stone, what's a piece of wood, what's gravel, or what that might be actually something. So there's been discussions with Axiom about uh, doing miniature core drilling. Like if, anyone who's in industry here and understands what core drilling is, we want to do that on a minuscule level. So we'll, we'll pick an area of interest, we'll send uh, a core drill down, collect a sample, bring it up, and test that sample for DNA on a, an area of interest. So that's the discussion that we're, that we're having right now uh, on, on the validity of that. Uh, it's promising. Axiom is is capable of of doing that uh they they just need a little bit of time to kind of get the technology together uh and get the analysis equipment together and we can look at something uh probably once it warms up a little bit uh in the spring and summer so that's that's a plan that's a strategy that the project teams thought about that's something that we're looking at and moving forward with the reason why uh what we're looking at kind of uh, getting creative and on trying to figure out uh, DNA and, and getting some confirmed hits is because we have some direction from our knowledge keepers, from our elders, from the community. And that direction is, is if you find something, leave it be. That's, that's the direction that, that we currently have. So in order for us to confirm uh, wh what it is that's under the ground, this is the option or the best option that we came up with so that we don't disturb what might be there, but at least we can at least prove that that's either nothing or, or that's something. So 
that's a lot of work. That's over 2,000 areas of interest that we have to do that with. So there's also a plan to do a process of elimination. Uh, we do have tentative approval from the church to train our GPR equipment uh, to identify their oldest part of their cemetery. The oldest part of their cemetery uh, dates the same time as, as the schools. So if we, if we take the GPR over there, we, we teach it what to look for as far as old, old ground, old ground disturbance, old cemetery, uh, plug that data into our data, we can use the process of elimination and, and get rid of some of those, some of those dots and then see where we're at uh, after that. So we also did some test, testing of the water because there are stories about dumps in the lake. So uh, we took the opportunity last winter to try and do some test scanning uh, while, the, while the lake was frozen. Uh, so we did achieve some areas of, of interest, but as they went out further, it got harder for, for, the, for the signal to, to travel clearly through the water, through the ice, and down, and then back up again. It's, it just got too deep. So any uh, scanning deeper than that is, is, not, is not plausible. Uh, according to our, our subject matter experts. So there again, we have to get creative. Uh, and Axiom is willing to work with us on that. They, they have certified divers. We, we put our heads together. We brainstormed. Maybe we could retrofit uh, the GPR to be dragged along uh, the lake bed uh, via a, a scuba diver, or we switched sonar or, or something like that. So there's a lot of out-of-the-box thinking on how we can accommodate those stories uh, that are that are out there uh, and talk about about the water. The other thing we had that's challenging is the current. You know, if if something was was dropped in the water here a hundred years ago, well, with current and everything like that, it might not be specifically there anymore. It might be down here. So that's that's a challenge in itself to try and figure out uh, where to scan and. And, and what to look for and, and things like that based, based on those stories. Uh, but there are a lot of stories uh, about the water. So it's something that we have to kind of think about a little bit more. It may take a little bit more time to scan the water, but uh, there is, uh, there, it's still uh, something that we're thinking about as, as a project team. <clears throat> so another discovery that we made um, and I have personal experience with this, is uh, there are underground rooms uh, just outside. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the generator here, the, the generator room, if you go sh straight east of, of that generator room, uh, the GPR has, has discovered underground rooms uh, that, that lead that way. Um, there's some of us students here in, in the building. Uh, there was a cave-in back in the late 80s. Uh, it got really hot here one day. The pavement caved in, and it exposed one of those rooms. And, you know, being, being a young fella, all, a few of us being young fellas, hey, let's go and, and crawl down in that room and, and see what we, we can see, you know, not thinking that it might cave in on us further or anything like that. So we jumped down in there. So me keeping that... In, in my memory, I, I made sure I asked to ask him, Axiom to scan that area because a few of us had, had actually been down in one of those underground rooms. And so the scan has, uh, has produced uh, more than one room that, that leads that way. And it brings to mind uh, that film. Um, uh, we were children, and and it brought to mind uh, late Glenn Anquat, and and he talks about underground rooms, and and what happened to him in, in those experiences. These stories are coming together, and they're fitting together, because just more east of that room is where that priest's house was located. 
that 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 house that he talked about in in the film it is just over there and these underground rooms lead that way so a lot of things are starting to piece together now and they're starting to coalesce based on the stories that we've heard based on where they've told us to look uh, and those areas that they told us to look are a part of the areas of interest that have come up because that's what guided us was the stories was was the data that we collected from that we 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 made sure that was uh first and foremost in our minds when we directed axiom okay concentrate here concentrate there concentrate over here according to the stories and the areas of interest have 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 proven have proven something there so a lot of these things are coming together last year it started to cave in this is the second room now that that showed up on on the gpr uh this isn't my room that that i that i that i uh went down in i didn't even know this room was here until until the gpr uh showed it but it's caving in there in in that secondary room uh there is a uh a gpr uh i guess overlay of of how those rooms are situated underneath but but we couldn't we couldn't find that that slide but uh if you if you take a look down in that hole you can see a corner of of my room that that, that i jumped down in way back when when i was a student here and an adjacent corner of another room uh which is corroborated by by those scans or by the gpr scans so like i said a lot of those pieces are starting to come together uh the the data and the stories are, are are matching up and and we find that very very uh interesting very overwhelming and and motivates us to to continue with with, with the searching <coughs> So now the potential strategy with that is to, because we're not dealing with uh, unmarked graves in that particular uh, area, um, we are uh, discussing uh, excavating those rooms. Because uh, when I went down in that room, I saw different things. Like I saw furniture, I saw a gurney, uh, I saw medical uh, jars uh, that were very old from from my meager expertise uh, being a teen and jumping down in there it was a very very interesting thing i was only on a break so i only had like five minutes to kind of jump down there and look around but there was a lot of old stuff i i knew it was an old room like it it predated uh, anything that i was aware of and that was always stuck in my mind is why is this room underground why is it why is it here uh and and it like it just left me with a lot of uh, uh, unanswered questions. So I personally am looking forward to the excavation of those rooms uh, all the way that way. Um, bring the, bring them up uh, and see what's what's there. There's artifacts we could probably collect uh, off those rooms. Uh, moving forward, it'll it'll help paint paint a better picture of what the purpose of those rooms were and why they were underground, and it corroborates other stories. There's lots of stories about the boiler room and the basement behind the boiler room and what's down there and, and like a lot of things are starting to piece together and it's it's a very very exciting time as far as that so we want to reach out to the archaeological folks um the u of s you know whoever has that expertise now moving forward and that'll be another warm uh warm uh season type of uh uh thing that we want to carry out uh, in, in this upcoming upcoming season. <clears throat> so all these things uh, take funding. Like uh, you, you need to pay subject matter experts to to help you along in, in these in these certain areas. So I'm glad the uh, minister is, is uh, listening to the uh, to to the presentation because uh, I want to revisit with with his team and and now, uh, discuss you know further supports further funding uh there's pieces that we never considered in in the first proposal that are now coming to light uh and that we have to plan for now 
moving moving forward. So <clears throat> I want to uh, bring up a, another discovery uh, now moving forward, and I want to uh, want to kind of caution uh, people now here, especially those who haven't heard uh, this this next segment. Uh, it is going to be a little graphic. Uh, it's going to be disturbing uh, to some to some folks uh, moving forward. So I just want to warn uh, people uh, about that. But uh, on October second, uh, this past October, uh, our security team, specifically uh, Tyrell, Tyrell Star Blanket, he was the first on the scene. He's standing back back over there. Um, he was the first. Uh, to discover this area here and what was discovered uh, at this area. So uh, if you can see that those two areas right there, this is where uh, security, uh, specifically Tyrell, uh, made, made his discovery uh, on, on shift uh, at this time. So in his uh, patrolling, he, uh, he came across uh, this. So this is a jawbone fragment that was analyzed by uh, the SAS coroner's office. Uh, it is a jawbone fragment of a child between the ages of four and six. Uh, the bone fragment has been aged to be about 125 years old, which puts us in the first school era. So that brings us back to about 1898. Uh, so this is um, physical, physical evidence, physical proof of, uh, of uh, an un unmarked grave. Uh, that's been uh, confirmed by both our uh, Philos Police Service and the SAS Corners uh, office. So, moving on to the the next slide, uh, it shows just a different uh, angle of the of the jawbone. So it's a right right mandible jawbone uh, fragment uh, that was discovered in that in that area. And if you want to bring up the school. So this is, this picture is dated 1888. Uh, the bone fragment was dated 1898. So this was the closest picture uh, that we could come to uh, that would kind of be similar to the age of the, of the fragment, of the jawbone fragment. And uh, if you take a look, that location would be in the front yard of the, of the first school. Now, one thing we noticed about this is that that looks like an uh, area that's prepped for, for agriculture, uh, a garden or, or something of that nature. Uh, if you will notice, there is no cemetery or graveyard uh, markings in the front of the of the school there so this is the closest uh, that we could get to to the age of the of the uh, of the bone fragment so uh, 10 years from this picture uh, approximately that that uh, those remains would be deposited in that in that area there so in our preliminary research that's that's basically what uh, what we've discovered so uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things to consider. Uh, that bone fragment is in an area of interest. Um, so we did uh, send that information back to Axiom, and Axiom is using the data uh, on those two uh, area of interest points, and they're going to again. Uh, put that into their system and do that process of elimination. Like I said, it's teaching the equipment on what to look for. Because we've, we've uh, identified uh, 
human remains on those two areas of interest, then they're going to compare that to all those other other areas and do that that process of elimination. One of the things, the reason why this picture is a little significant is because one of the things that we were we were told when we were starting out as a project team is we were told watch the gophers. The gophers will tell you where they are. And and we didn't understand really what that meant until it actually happened. Uh, that's a that's a new gopher hole in that area of interest, along with the the jawbone scattered all over around that gopher hole were other little pieces of, of bone. Those bones ended up to be uh, animal in nature. So what was happening was when when the gophers were excavating their their new tunnel systems in there, they would run into bone fragments, they would bring them up and they would they would just kinda kinda deposit them on the ground there. So along for for lack of a better word, it was a pile, like a little flat little pile of bones. It had a little mixture of everything in there. And then this is what Tyrell came across. He came across that 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 area of of bones spread out here and there and in that one significant one significant one. So uh, they they ran into something while they were excavating their their holes and and they brought it up and they just placed it there on on the ground. So this is uh, lucky for us because we were we were waiting for uh, DNA uh, core sampling to make any type of determination, but uh, the gophers helped us out and and uh, sped up our agenda a little bit on on what what was discovered. So a lot of next steps, there's protocol obviously that we have to follow uh, moving forward. We're already in discussion on, on what to do with the remains. Uh, the remains are present uh, here in, in, that, in that teal colored, colored box. Uh, there's protocol that we have to follow now. Uh, so the project team is, is uh, making, those, making those arrangements uh, as far as protocol. Uh, we have to respect the, the deceased. We have to respect the, the remains of the deceased. And that opens up a whole lot of other considerations that we have to now engage the community with. You know, what if this, what if that, well, what are you going to do? Uh, a lot of things we have to consider uh, now moving, moving forward. <clears throat> so where do we go from here? Aside from the cultural protocol, the observations that we have to do, uh, where do we go from here? Um, it's going to mean more community consultation. It's going to mean uh, more input from residential school survivors. I'm not just talking about the ones within the community, but all survivors that attended here. Uh, we're looking at getting that, that input uh, moving forward. How are we going to uh, direct the the project now moving forward. What are those things we have to consider? One of the major things that we didn't consider in the beginning days was mental health. There's a lot of project team members, uh, employees that are employed under the project, like security. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stress and and uh, heavy heaviness. In, in having to be associated with the grounds, knowing what's here, knowing what we're looking for, uh, having to maintain, you know, an air of, of confidentiality. Like uh, I commend our, our security team. They had to sit on this information since October 2nd uh, and not say anything. Uh, imagine that coming to work, knowing what you know and not having to say anything until we got all our documentation in place, till we made all our confirmations, you know. So again, I commend the security team for uh, for keeping it under the hat for, for so long. <coughs> Oops, sorry. But uh, we also had a very, very beautiful meeting with the community on the commemorative process. What are we going to do to honor uh, 
the students. How are we going to commemorate them? How are we going to build a, a memorial? Uh, we, we spent an evening here <clears throat> and talked with our, our community members <clears throat> on what, what are we going to do? What does that look like? And we got a lot of input, a lot of input, a lot of great ideas on, on what we're going to do as far as a commemoration, what that project's going to look like. So <clears throat> the main project is now going to, uh, I guess, split off into other projects, other considerations. So that, uh, that's, that was Orange Shirt Day, uh, our last Orange Shirt Day. This was a day or two prior to, to the discovery. Uh, very coincidental that we were, we were to discover uh, that, that bone fragment after this picture was, was taken. We had just finished uh, walking the grounds, smudging the grounds, and, and being together as a community to, to honor uh, Orange Shirt Day. So uh, that is uh, that concludes my my presentation. So uh, we'll go into uh, comments from from the chiefs here. Once those comments are completed, then we'll we'll open it up to the media for for some discussion. So uh, with that, uh, who do we have first? We have uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Before Bob uh, Bobby, we'll we'll go back to to chief. Thank you, uh, Sheldon. I think we all appreciate the, the report, the information that you shared to all of us and acknowledge all the work that has been done leading up to today. And as I indicated when I first began, this is unprecedented. This is something that we never we never thought we would be doing. Uh, we continued to do things here on Wapimustasis. Uh, we began uh, some development in housing, some of the things that we wanted to do in economic development, and, and we were moving forward in some thought until the announcement in the other province of uh, British Columbia uh, the unmarked graves over there, the 215 unmarked graves. And and so everything we kind of put in obeyance, we put things on hold until this process has started and taken place and will carry over time and, and maybe we might not be able to do the things we thought we could. This discovery has changed everything. It's changed the things that we're going to do. It's changed our mindset. It's changed our, our way of life in a way. At the beginning, over this past little while here, the last few months, as we're uh, beginning our meetings, uh, we were asked, what do you want from this? What do you, what do you want from the discovery? And we don't want anything. We don't want, we don't want the things that, well, we kind of do a little bit, <laughs> but we, for the most part, we want to honor. We want to honor this young child, the remains of this young child. We want the governments to take accountability, the churches to take accountability, the police services to take accountability 
That's what we want from this. No longer do we want the things that have oppressed us, those kind of things that oppressed us and, and kept us down. Though over time, as, as our prayers indicated, we've been able to work our way up. But this has changed that. This has expite, expedited the process and the way we think. The governments, we need you to rethink the things that you have done to us. We need you to move past. And we need you to understand the way our ancestors wanted us to believe. They wanted us to believe in our treaty perspective. So we need to change that path. So I thank Minister Mark Miller. We reached out to the Prime Minister. But we've accepted Mark and his, he couldn't be here physically. But he wanted to be part of this process, so he is here via the, the Zoom. In your minds, If you can think of some of the things that our security th team has gone over, gone through while they looked after this land. Astam. Astam. Those are some of the voices that are heard here. And the buildings that are adjacent. They hear little rustlings. They hear noises and there's nothing there. And when they go check, they see evidence. There's little fingers, there's, there's little finger marks. And over time, prior to that, in some of the examples, there's young children running in a distance over the arena where we have adjacent. And when they went checked, there was nothing there. He went outside on a snowy day when it was snowy on that particular day. There was no, no prints. So I say those things in the helpful way in a healing way. So those are the things I touched on, those things that happen here. And over time we've had ceremonial, we have feasts, we had ceremony, we had horse dances, we had ghost dances, we had different processes to help this area could heal, but it still, it still lingers. So I wanted to tell you that a little bit because that's what our security, and I thank the security for doing that necessary work with us. You see some of the things that are out there, the fences that are up now. We did that the other day, and I thank the security for that work. And we don't know what might happen after this. This is unprecedented, and we're moving that way. And even today, this is not planned, it's not scripted in any way. We are moving with what we have found. And we'll bring honor to the remains. That of a young child. And now we know it's proof. What we kind of knew in our minds and our hearts, the way we were being told. 
But this is proof. So it's very significant that way. And we have to move together and we have to help one another. I said that the other day when we met with our, when we engaged our people. We have to learn to help one another and forgive one another of those challenges sometimes that our communities face. And we have to help each other. So I continue to encourage that. Then we got to work together and change the policies that have affected us. The Indian Act. That's what has challenged us so many lives, changed so many lives when it wasn't part of our, our ancestors' thinking. They wanted us to share the land. They wanted us to be friends. They wanted us to be family. And that's the impact. That's the impact we're, we're reliving a little bit with what we found. So I ask you in a, in a, hum, in a humble way, in a kind way, you know, to be respectful and surround each other, surround the ones that are, are hurting and, and need that, that continued healing. And we're always healing, right? We're always continued healing. There's always devastation that we face in our communities. Our elder, our Kateic, reminded us that, reminded us, reminded us of that this morning. And we gotta be more aggressive, he said. We gotta be more aggressive in our leadership. We gotta help change the family support systems, the Indian child family support systems, the justice systems. So these are strong statements, but that necessary work needs to continue. So I'll say that much. Hi, hi. We'll now move to uh, FSN Chief Bobby Cameron for his comments. Nigan, Nigan Mantu, Nascompton Miogis Galme Gods, Egua Kitim no Kitayak. As compton and all, repeat to a tado spogana, he got gives the most of all. He got gives someone. Kakio, he pay to tig, as compton co up on the noal. He met set ye canos. Kainanto, tetaman, noago magantic, Absis pogo skateman. Maga. Kakio akame mok kai pakchi kagi sumwa esto kagi sumwen first and foremost we thank our creator for a beautiful day today our knowledge keepers for lifting the pipes and praying for every one of us. Chief Michael Starry and your council and your community, the survivors that are here, the descendants, the families that are here, you know who you are. Chiefs that are here, council and all our technicians Mark on the line and our MLA, we welcome you. Lots of feelings this morning. 
all sorts of emotions of anger, hurt, pain, anguish. And a feeling that we want justice. A feeling that we want justice served to those individuals that are still living, breathing, that have done these horrific crimes to our children. They are still living out there. And we've said this for years and years to the justice system that has failed our First Nation people time and time and time again. Oh, racism is alive and well in the justice system. If there's anything now that they can do, they can begin by bringing those individuals to justice. We've traveled to the Delma site where we hear stories of footprints being found in a farmer's house. We've been to Sturgeon Landing. We've been to Beauvel. We've been to Muskaugan, Gordons, Beardies. And everyone has stories of pain, anguish, hurt, and anger. That little baby, those bones, was someone's child, someone's grandchild, someone's chapan, was ripped from that he or she's family's home, kidnapped. That same child would have been someone's parent, grandparent, and chapan but never got the chance to live life and experience it. Never got the chance to have Christmases and family gatherings. Back in those days, it was our sun dances and our ceremonies and our big lodges, our rain dances. Never got the chance because it was robbed from he or she. Magumagantik, friends and relatives. That particular site, this site, and many other sites are crime scenes. Those are crime scenes that must be addressed immediately. The government of the day spent a pile of money building and rebuilding and rebuilding these residential school sites. Mark Miller, you're the government of the day. And don't be offended what I'm about to say. Because it's not your fault. It's not our fault. It's those settlers and colonizers of the day who thought they knew what we what was best for us. In every site we visited, every knowledge keeper, every survivor said, and I'm sure here in Star Blanket you would want this. You spend piles of money building these schools so you can commit horrific crimes on our little babies. Mark, you can begin by working with Star Blanket and in many, many other residential school sites to build healing and wellness centers, what we need on our First Nation communities. So many things have been forced upon our people before treaty, during treaty, and after treaty. Right now, you know it, and I know it, and all the listeners out there know it. 
when alcohol and drugs were introduced to our people, one of the worst things that could ever have ever happened to our communities. We lose people every week, every day. We're losing our children to the provincial social services system. We have more children in care today than we did have children going to the residential schools. We have a lot of work and a lot of healing to do. Again, Chief Michael Starr and others and everyone that's here. We expect, we demand, immediate work. In 2011, my son Drake Cameron and I We attended a ghost dance, a chicken dance, and a horse dance right in these open grounds here. Our children are innocent people. They have innocent spirits. And I was off visiting some of the knowledge keepers. <clears throat> And I looked out by the beach, and my son was playing around, talking to somebody. Just about sunset. And I asked him, who are you talking to, my boy? He said, there are some kids playing here. I didn't see any children. You see, our children see those spirits. They feel them. This country was literally built on the bones of our people and our blood is in this land right across this country, coast to coast to coast. It is time to start moving forward to the government of the day and our provincial government. It is time to start moving forward and working with the First Nations and the survivors and the descendants who will drive their healing journey, who will drive what will come next. But definitely those healing and wellness centers that are so desperately needed in every First Nation. And this justice system must do better for our First Nations. These are our comments from the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, from our executive, our vice chiefs who are unable to be here, Dutch Laurent, Ali Beer, Heather Beer, and David Pratt. We pray every single day, like each and every one of you do, that our people find that healing journey some way or another. We need action now, and we need action immediately from all levels of government. It must happen on behalf of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. Thank you for inviting us and listening to us. These are, are the words of our people, our survivors, the descendants. Let's, con let's continue to work together. And to the governments, work with the First Nations. Listen to them. They have the best solutions. They know what's needed within their First Nation communities. You don't. Ekwase, wago magantik. Hai, hai. Thank you, Chief Cameron. We'll move it on to uh, Tribal Chair of the Philo Capels Tribal Council, uh, Jeremy Fourhorns.
Thank you, Sheldon. Mama go tell me on. She meant to go meal set. Then say kia all. I say hello to you all. I acknowledge our elder uh, AJ Felix for lifting that pipe, speaking for us this morning, for what we had to do today, for the stuff, the things that we have to talk about and what we have to address. I want to acknowledge Chief Star and the Council of Star Blanket Cree Nation for inviting us all and walking forward with the work that they have had to do on this project for the last little while. I acknowledge our Federation Grand Chief Bobby Cameron for being here, for supporting the Star Blanket community. I also acknowledge my chiefs, my Fowl Hills Capel Tribal Council chiefs who are sitting here in the room, starting from the far west, Niganit Cree Nation Alvin Francis, Chief Alvin Francis, and Wood Mountain Lakota Chief Ellen Lacane, Paipot Neheopwata Chief Mark Fox, Muscapeding Soto Chief Melissa Tavida, Pasqua Soto Chief Pigan. Standing Buffalo, Dakota, Chief Redman. Pipixis, Cree Nation, Chief Frank Dieter. Okanese, Cree Nation, Chief Richard Stonechild. Star Blanket, Cree Nation, Chief Michael Starr. Acknowledge Little Black Bear, Chief Clarence Belgard. And Chief Scotty Shappy of the Carry the Kettle, Nakota. Many of these chiefs are here in the room today, and I, I thank them for being here, for supporting the people that have come here, for supporting Star Blanket. I also want to acknowledge the Star Blanket Indian Residential School Search Committee for knowing very well that there's going to be a likelihood of making a find of this nature that they have. I acknowledge him for that, knowing that that's going to happen, but still undertaking the work, still volunteering their time to do this work. I acknowledge the survivors of these residential schools right across our lands, right across our territories, everything that they've had to live through, that they've had to endure. But I also thank them for that resilience that they carried through those very difficult times and that they've shared that with us, that a little bit of that passed on so that we can carry on. I acknowledge them for that. I acknowledge our visiting dig dignitaries, Minister Mark Miller, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations for our partner, the Federal Government of Canada, as well as a sitting MLA for this, this area, who's Travis Kizig. I acknowledge you for being here. This, this very difficult time for many people. And for the people in attendance for coming here, for yourselves, but mainly for those that have gone before us and how we acknowledge and honor the people that have gone before our time, especially children. And for the media in attendance, you know, I do acknowledge you being here. What we're here for today, we've heard it for many, many generations. Our old people have told us these stories for many, many generations. We know, we've always known, because it's a part of our history. Our people have lived it. We lived it. This is just physical proof in that way that all of those things, those atrocities that we were told that existed, that they were reality. You know, as 
our FSI in chief and, and Starblink in chief star said this, this child could have come from any one of our families in our communities. Because as AJ Felix said this morning, being from Sturgeon Lake First Nation, north of Prince Albert, he was also in this school with his siblings. That's how far away kids came for an education. So that's why I say that this child could be from any one of our communities, any one of our families. And we acknowledge them. The reason why we're here, you know, Chief Cameron alluded to it, that way of thinking, we know what's best for you. We know what's best for First Nation people. To have a non-First Nation person take that way of thinking. Yes, many of those that committed these atrocities, many might not be around. But that way of thinking still exists. That way of thinking still exists in government. Both levels of non-First Nation government, province and federal. We as leaders still deal with that way of thinking on this regular basis in today's age. We know what's best for you. They don't say that outright, but their policies tell us that outright. And just as my fellow chief said earlier, enough is enough. We're here as true partners of treaty. It's also why our partners are in these lands is because our ancestors opened that pathway up. And we're living up to those standards with less than what was promised. For over a hundred years, we've been making our communities thrive on way less than what was promised. That spirit and intent of treaty, we're not going to let that die. We won't ever let that die. Our future generations won't ever let that die. And that's what we want to tell government, is that we have always approached everything that we have to do to help our people to improve their lives, we have always approached it in a collaborative manner. And many, many times, we have never received that treatment in return. I support Chief Cameron's comments that our communities need proper healing centers. We need proper institutions in place because we still have many people that are impacted by the trauma that these schools have created. And for many people that think that residential schools are things of a hundred years ago, even in my time, I was a student at this very school. And I am younger than that man sitting down at the end of the table. <laughs> but in all seriousness, that's what our people need. And we're not going to stop fighting until all of these things are in place to address everything that we have had to go through on simple not being treated as a fellow human being. That thinking. <laughs> With that, I don't want to take up too much of our time because it's very heavy, it's very emotional when you think about the child. But to honor this child going forward. And I speak for all of our leadership here, Chief Michael Starr, Chief Bobby Cameron, the File Hills Capel Chiefs here, as well as many, many of those that couldn't be here. We're not going to stop fighting for what our people deserve. Again, all our people, our grassroots people that came here today, I really thank you. You know, everything that we work forward towards, everything that those before us, the leaders before our time, have worked towards, 
is to improve the lives of our children, our grandchildren, those unborn. And I thank you for the support. You know, we thank you for the support that you provide to us. And each other, from leadership to our people, we will call on you again in issues of importance where we need to stand together. We will stand together with you in the future as well. Thank you. Next up, we have a member uh, of the Starbling Cree Nation, uh, our elder, one of our knowledge keepers, and uh, residential school survivor, uh, Sharon Strongar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Very hard to sit in front and see this young child in front of us. <laughs> I have grandchildren. Chapanak. Residential school survivors. My mom, my grandpa. My brothers and myself came to the school. Thank you, Chief Cameron, Chief Mike. We were taken away from our parents, but we learned how to survive. We learned how to forgive. They tried to take our spirits away. They tried to take the Indian out of us, but thank the creator, we're back here. Strong as we'll ever be helping each other. We need your prayers, everyone. We have to live with this. We have to live here. Every day, we're going to be reminded that we're walking against people of the spirit world. Like one elder said today, we will survive. We will survive and we will strive to see our children grow. That's what that elder said today, but he said it in a good way. Take care of each other. Love one another. Suck it to win. Walk with to win all those things that are important to us. Take care of one another. Love one another. Because back then we didn't know what love was. We weren't told we were loved. All we knew was the abuse. But we're here. We because there's no word for goodbye. Thank you. And now if any of the, uh... oh yes, yes, uh, I will give some time to our Zoom uh, participants, uh, Minister Miller, for your comments.
you always know that these searches what I've covered. And uh, I don't think this makes this discovery or one in the future anyway. Recording so, in I, progress. So I, I do want to salute the security teams and the, all the workers who put time in despite knowing uh, what they would inevitably found, would find. Canada will continue to support you throughout the steps to uncover the truth foremost and return loved ones to your community at your pace, obviously, and as the truth foremost. There's certainly nothing that I can say to make it better. So I will stop there today, continue to listen to you, uh, and offer you all the support from the government of Canada. Thank you, Minister Miller. Uh, now we will open the floor to questions from the media. If you have any questions to present, <coughs> there is a mic there to my left. Chairs has a mic there. If you have a question, uh, media representation, you can go to that mic there and present your question. Uh, to the table. Testing one, two, three. Um, all I, I asked the media just to um, say your name and uh, where you're reporting from, and you can ask the questions. Thanks. Hi, Lisa Schick with 980 CJME, um, either Mr. Poitras or anybody else at the table who is comfortable speaking. Um, if you'd maybe be able to talk a little bit about what it was like uh, going every day and doing these searches. I guess uh, from, uh, I guess from my perspective, you know, uh, when we started the project team, uh, the initial days, there was a lot of uh, questions, a lot of concern, a lot of motivation, a lot of uh, what do we do, how, how do we start? Um, so we got a lot of good guidance in the beginning and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, it, it made our direction and our plan of action uh, a lot more clear. Uh, for the project team. Coming here every day, uh, it's been emotional every day, uh, especially if you're, a f if you're closely connected to the school, if, if you're a former student of the school, if you, if you knew uh, other students, hey, look, we're getting involved into the search now, we're going to start searching, because a lot of the other IRS projects were already moving and they kept looking at us. Well, when are you guys going to do something? Well, what are you guys going to do? So there was a lot of motivation behind that, but all of us have those experiences, have listened to those stories, have heard those stories from our, our relatives and everything like that, walking the grounds and, and knowing. I, I, for one, personally knew that, that this day would eventually come. I, I, I knew based on my grandparents' stories, based on my, my elder aunts and uncles' stories, and I, I knew I had no doubt that this day would come. I just didn't know when. So it's been emotional, just like Chief Mike has said. It's been emotional since day one. We've been at it a year and a half now, and it doesn't get any any easier. That's why those mental health supports, those those wellness facilities that the chiefs have talked about up here, that's very much needed. This is a niche, a niche uh, area, I guess you could say. There hasn't been anything like this that has been considered the effects, not only from survivors' perspectives, but now the ones that have to work on, on the projects, have to deal with those with those, with that data, with those findings, and and having to reopen old wounds in order to find the truth. So, 
it's it's been emotional for sure. There's nothing else I can say about that. Hello. I just wanted to add, you know, some of my comments, and I want to acknowledge, first of all, our singers as well, the White Calf singers. Thank you uh, for being. I didn't know, didn't acknowledge you earlier, and thank you for being with us and, and providing that needed song from our ancestors. So, thank you so much. I guess the emotions are are overwhelming for sure. Right from, you know, uh, Orange Shirt Day. That was uh, kind of the the beginning, I believe. And in our way, there was some some way that needed to to happen. You know, we on that day we always gather. We we uh, smudged the, the grounds totally, and then. Right after that, that's when the discovery was made. And I want to acknowledge the security again and the emotions that they felt on that particular day. In particular, the finder and, and Tyrell Star Blanket. You thank, you know, thank him for doing and walking the grounds. They did a lot of walking the grounds, a lot of the security, and they still do. They try to do that necessary work. And their hearts are really heavy from the work that they do. And I try to explain a little bit on the things that they go through and the things they encounter over those periods of time. So as uh, Sheldon indicated, you know, the, the mental health supports that are here, I thank you for being here as well and providing that needed someone to talk to you know you need someone to talk to and let that out get that out get that hurt feeling out that sad feeling out so again a lot of uh research you know my colleagues have memories they were talking to me a little bit this morning and over time they have stories too of their ancestors going to school here So doing the research, we have a, you know, our team too. And even as they go and do that research, it's emotional. They're finding things that are connected to not only our nation, but other nations. So we're gathering that, that needed data and we're, we're housing it as safe as we can and to have that eventually be available at some point, in whatever way that it'll unfold, whether it be a, a building, a monument, that's where we'll keep it. And behind us, as you see, as you come in here, we, we did our best to provide a mural of support in honor of the children here. We had people coming in here desecration, desecrating our buildings, putting unfathomable things on our, on our buildings, calling us names. And that's emotional too. You know, so I think we have an annual walk now. My sister Dale and the team, Kathy, we do that necessary walk and we provide a little bit of support to the team that way. So that's important too, and it helps. So if you want to come, come and walk with us. July 1st, you'll get sore legs. Eh. But it's good. So thank you. Father Huguenard kept uh, very detailed records of deaths and burials. I'm just wondering if you have attempted to check his records 
1897 to perhaps identify this body or this person that has been buried here. Have you been working with the church in an attempt to identify uh, the remains that you found? I guess the... Uh So uh, we, we do have the information uh, that, that you speak of. Uh, we have a research team. We've developed a research team. There is a lot of data and a lot of history that we have to go through. So that work has, has started. Uh, we do have archival information in our office uh, here. So that is one of the goals uh, to go meticulously through uh, the archives, the information of the day. Uh, to see maybe if there was record of it. Uh, birth, the birth and death records were kept rather detailed by Father Huguenard. So if you check 1897, 1898, 1899, uh, you should be able to match, you should be able to match the, uh, or possibly identify the, the unidentified human remains. I'll take that question. My name is Sherry Belgarm. I'm one of our project coordinators. Uh, before I was one of the project coordinators, I was actually the lead researcher for the project. Um, and we had a team of researchers. There was six of us. Um, Stephanie Belgard is one of the other researchers. We, they were, we were summer students at the time. And we had Adele Bebo, Sophie Bebo, Stephanie, myself, Connie Starblanket, and Kaylee Starblanket. No, sorry, Sage, <laughs> Sage Star, Star Blanket. We were the researchers, and for that period of time, in our own records at Star Blanket, in the band office, um, unfortunately, over the years, we did have some really heavy flooding, so a majority of the records, the original records that were maintained here at, on the site, were damaged due to flood and waters. However, the book from the early period, the very first period, the very first school, the Huguenard and then the grade nuns recorded every single student right down to the original student that is listed as number one in this school. We have those records. So we can go back and we can see how students died, where they were transferred to, um, if they made it home, up to a certain point in time. However, we can't identify who this child was just simply from the records. Um, we would need to do DNA analysis in order to attempt to see or even make a relation to that. Um, and then in addition to that, even if we went through those records from 1898, um, there was a lot of deaths, like there was when we go through that book, it was really, really hard on our research team. Um, I, uh, as the lead researcher, I, I encouraged our team to constantly take a lot of self-care breaks because going through that book was very heavy, heavy emotional work because there were so many deaths listed in that book. I'm sorry. And it was for many numerous different reasons, but it was very, very hard. Hard work. So I hope I answered your question. This is uh, Connor with Global Virginia. I'm wondering maybe for Sherry or Sheldon, if you have an idea of roughly how many students attended uh, the schools at, at Capel over the, the course of their operations.
we're fortunate to have some of our uh, research team here. I think actually that might be a better question for Stephanie. She did a bulk of the research um, during that time. Hi guys, um, can you repeat your question please? might have attended how many students might have attended the schools over the course of their operation it depends on which school you're talking about as well because um, there's three schools right and then that's a wide variety of children that came to the school from across Turtle Island <laughs> so it depends on what school you're talking about if you're talking about the first school uh, I uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I can't really give you a, a number, to be honest. I can't give you a precise number because children come and go and... <laughs> She's too shy to, to come up with an answer. <laughs> for that we could have put her on the spot <laughs> yeah so she she did a lot of that research uh, this past summer and this is actually her first time back since since that summer so we, we didn't prep her or anything like that for for your question but then. Uh, i'm just getting a text here minister miller has to go so i just want to acknowledge uh uh, Mark Miller, uh, Minister, what, one last time before he leaves uh, the Zoom. So thank you, uh, Minister Miller, for, for joining us here to, today. Can answer. Hey, Sheldon, um, Cherish here. I do have a fact sheet that I will be sending out to the media with some of those, some of that information. So I'll send that to you and get the right numbers for you. So they'll be sent uh, with the media release. Okay. One more. Yeah. Okay. Good question, though. Good, good question. Thank you. Um, just one more question. I know this was touched on in the presentation. Can you maybe go over uh, uh, some of the, the sources for which funding was uh, taken to for this project, and whether you're hoping to receive more funding from different levels of government? I know we just we just lost the minister, unfortunately. But uh, if you're hoping for more funding from the federal and provincial governments to continue the the search for the different projects that you've mentioned. Yeah, our main source of funding was the Residential Schools Missing Children Community Support Funding. That is the only funding that we applied for and have received uh, thus far. It is the same uh, pot of dollars that FSIN had applied for and which funded our project in the, in the early stages until we got our own uh, funding proposal in place and then we went through the the, the review and, and whatnot, and, and then uh, achieved uh, approval for, for our own funding. So we're able to to step away from FSIN after that point, because uh, we're able to uh, move forward uh, under our own funding funding source from the same from the same uh, uh, funding funding source there. So yeah, that's the only only uh, source of funding that we've uh, achieved so far. Hi, um, Carrie Banjo with Eagle Feather News. Um, Sheldon, you had mentioned one of the next phases you're hoping to explore is gathering survivor stories. Is there any idea of how that will transpire? How do you think that will look? How can survivors um, reach out and maybe share their stories with you? So right now, uh, both of our coordinators and our research team are all trained to take uh, those stories. Uh, there's different mediums that they can share their story. It can be a phone call. They can come in person. Uh, they can send an email. There, there's different ways to uh, to uh, collect the story, document it, and and uh, record it for for posterity. So there's different avenues. Uh, we're even getting a phone line uh, installed in here so that they can a person can just reach out and, and make that appointment uh, with with our research team and our coordinators to uh, uh, 
uh, to get those stories brought in. There is uh, contact information. There's pamphlets there in the back. It has the the information of who to contact uh, if you have something to share. Our initial media event, <clears throat> for those of you who were here prior when we kicked off the, the project there uh, back back a year or so ago, that motivated a lot of uh, uh, former uh, school survivors to come forward, and we had an influx of stories at that time. Uh, we're hoping now, moving forward, people are a little bit more comfortable with uh, with sharing with sharing their stories. So we have the ability to record and and store that that information. Uh, we're we're open we're open to take stories at any time, and the coordinators are are ready, willing, and able to 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 meet with those individuals and, and take those stories uh, at any time. Just have to make the arrangements. That was just the second part of my question. Just a follow-up question to that. Um, I know the TRC went around, they gathered a lot of survivor stories. A lot of those survivor stories um, excluded the, um, what I'd like to refer to as the last generation of residential school survivors. Those of, um, my, of my time, and we didn't get a chance to share our stories. Um, moving forward, are you going to have these stories like in a permanent collection because it takes a lot for a survivor to come forward and share their stories. And um, it's really disheartening for me to hear that a lot of these stories of our old ones are gonna be lost. So will you be taking all the stories from anyone who's gonna share them and guarantee that you will keep them? Yes. Okay. Uh, for a lack of a better example, we're going to try and develop our own miniature TRC here uh, as part of the commemorative uh, uh, ideas that, that we discussed here. One of them is going to be a, a database and we'll hopefully turn that into something that uh, uh, people can, can view, uh, people can read, people can experience. Uh, doesn't matter what era uh, of story whatever it belongs to, even if it was a story that was passed down and then, and then relate to us, or it could be, you know, from, from you and I, where we're both students here at the same time, you know, we, we have stories too. So uh, we won't turn anyone away. If you, if you have a story, uh, come and share it. It's, it's open. Uh, okay. Laurent Stachot from uh, Radio Canada, CBC. Um, do you have any sort of time frame for when you might get more answers on those 2,000 hits, when the drilling will start, when the results can come back? When can people accept, yeah, expect more answers? Yeah, we're tentatively looking at the spring or maybe early summer. Uh, we're giving our partner Axiom a chance to uh, bring all those pieces together, those, those uh, core drilling pieces uh we we we, need, we have to give them time we we've expressed what we want they they they've said yes that we can accomplish that so the ball is in their court now to to put all those pieces together bring us the equipment and, and start the 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 core sampling okay so, so you, you don't need any more fund to do that you have what you need to oh do. we always okay. we always need funding yes, this, but the, to the get core, the answers yeah, right now the core sampling piece was a consideration that's new. We didn't yeah. consider that in the first proposal, so uh, it's going to be part of the new work plan for sure. Okay, thank you. Hi there, uh, Alex Alon with the Regina Leader Post. Uh, it was mentioned the number, the two thousand hits. Sorry, uh, should have done that earlier. Um, you, you mentioned the significance of, of two thousand. Uh, possible hits. And Minister Miller mentioned, though, that this is also the first time that remains have been found. And I think Mr. Forhorn said that this is confirmation of, of what's always been known. But I was hoping for the table, anybody who would like to speak on it, what do you feel is the significance of this to not only this search, but every other search happening in Canada? Well, the significance from my perspective is uh, 
validation. Uh, the stories have always been told, passed down from generation to generation. We, while we're collecting stories, there's a sense of relief. Well, no one has listened to us before. We, we tell our story here, we tell our story there, no one's listening. Uh, it, ta it takes the IRS projects and those teams to take those stories and, and give a sense of relief to the storyteller. Uh, this discovery here at this site just, just validates what we've, what we've always known. It validates to the world uh, that, that those stories uh, have some merit uh, and we're going to move on that uh, moving, moving forward. Uh, like I said in, in my earlier comment, I, I, I knew without a doubt that we would find something here at this site. Uh, and I continue to believe that there will be further findings uh, moving moving forward. So, uh, in a keyword of validation. And going back to that comment that I made regarding validation, validation in that sense is not necessarily, um, I guess, in a respectful way, a needed part for our people because we've always known that it was there but where it does mean something to us is dignity so where this fragment that was explained to us was found even during my years of attending this residential school for four years there was never ever an area marked out as a cemetery never in the history when you inter someone in a designated place, our people respect that place because that place is where they're laid to rest with dignity. And that's what's important in this case is we want to make sure that all of these children receive the dignity that they would have otherwise received in our home communities. That's what's important to us. I just want to uh, add, well, first of all, before I, I add, I wanted to, <clears throat> some of our, uh, our young people are here, uh, little ones are here, so we acknowledge them too, and for coming here and, and listening, you know, and that's the generational impact of the trauma of this residential school and all residential school, not only in this region, but all regions have impacted. And how we have to you know, continue to teach them, not only in our, our, our school systems on our nations, but also the federal or the provincial school system. So we got to continue that work to help heal and be mindful of the things that have happened in the past. And I know maybe they are, but this finding again escalates that. They still have, they must and will, and we have to push that, that it carries on. It carries on the teaching. It carries on to make sure that they have that understanding. And then the colonialism that we talk about, the, the generation, the generational impacts must discontinue in some point. We are, they say, in the seventh generation, and it may take that much time before it can be fully understandable and, and a way and and that we have equal, equal ability, if you will, and that our treaties are impacted the way our ancestors wanted them to be. So, hi, hi. Thank you, Chief Star. Um, that precludes our questions from the media for today. Um, I know that the media, you guys have some deadlines. I have the media release here, so if you guys want to come see me over here, 
I just want to thank everybody for attending today. We're just going to do a quick presentation to our speakers up and our dignitaries. So our committee will quickly do a presentation. So thank you. Okay, we have some uh, some gifts that we wanted to present. Uh, there's a little bit of change in the agenda. Uh, the project team was uh, communicating with each other over over text here. In in in, uh, in the interim here, so uh, our first gift we want to present to uh, Tyrell Tyrell Starblanket. Uh, he was the one who initially came across the discovery. So. He's part of our security team, so we want to acknowledge him as the first one on the scene to, to make the discovery. And once, uh, sorry, when, when, when we're concluding as well, um, after the presentation, when we do the honor song, we'll ask for an honor song. You're, the Katea Kier wanted, if you're wanting to come and pass by and, and put your hands on the remains, you're more than welcome. We open that invitation as well once we do the honor song. So, hi, hi. Our next uh, uh, member of the security team uh, that, that was part of the discovery is uh, Bobby Joe Bobby jo Starr. If she's in the building. These are members of the security team uh, that followed Tyrell and were a part of the initial discovery. The next member of the uh, <clears throat> initial discovery team was Vicky Denemy. Vicky Denemy, if she's in the building. If we can uh, get the leadership, if you want to come and stand at the back here with up with with our team, you're more than welcome as they come by and 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 pay their respects. So we we ask you that way from our team and the, and the chief and the tribal chief ask you to come and do that. Thank you. Our next uh, security team member that was there in the initial discovery was Gage Starr. Gage Starr. Our next uh, member of security that was there in the initial discovery was uh, Mrs. Gage Star, Kirsten Goodwill. And last but not least, the final member of the initial discovery team. Uh, he's the supervisor of our security security team here, uh, Mr. Scott McNabb.
We also want to acknowledge uh, our elder uh, who lifted the pipe for us this morning, uh, uh, Uncle A.J. Felix. A.J., Uncle A.J. Maybe if Auntie Patsy could come and come and grab Uncle's. Uh, oh, Donna's gonna come grab it. And then the one, uh, our elder who lifted the ladies' pipe this morning, uh, uh, Auntie Ethel Starblanket, or Ethel Dubois. Uh, remember, she changed her name. <laughs> Ethel Dubois. And we want to acknowledge our elder who spoke here at the at the table uh, for her words, uh, Elder Sharon Strongarm. Our visiting leadership, who took time out of his busy schedule to be with us here today. Our Grand Chief of the FSIN, Chief Bobby Cameron. Our local tribal council leadership, who also took time out of his busy schedule to sit with us here today, uh, tribal chair Jeremy Fourhorns. Our media relations representative, the ones who dedicated a lot of her time to help us put this day together uh, and help us manage uh, and train up our folks in, in the ways of media relations, uh, Cherish Francis. I keep chiming in here uh, just to uh, remind as well, you know, when the security uh, watches us, uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to uh, place things, we, 
at the bottom of our uh, mural. Mural? <laughs> mural. <laughs> if you're wishing to bring something, that's where we decided to, to do that. So just to let you know. And then uh, the project team would like to acknowledge uh, a youth representative to to symbolize uh, uh, the the youth and and the the ones that uh, uh, are represented throughout the years as uh, coming to the school. Uh, we want to symbolize and respect the, the youth. Uh, in, in that manner, so uh, we're asking uh, Ravina to come in and uh, accept the Starbuck on behalf of the youth. She said, "No more, no more blankets." <laughs> okay, uh, as as what Chief Mike said before, we're gonna do an honor song, and uh, for those of you who wish to do a pass by uh, at the at the remains here, uh, you're more than welcome to to do that. Uh, as the drum group has has uh, are singing their song, so. With that, uh, take it away.